Well, welcome to Western Sydney Unfiltered. We are joined today by somebody who is normally as unfiltered as I am anyway, uh, Dr. Tim Williams, um, the, uh, the doyen of urban renewal, an urbanist, uh, contrarian, um, an academic, or worse, a barrister, apparently back in his day, <laughs> and, and a history academic and teacher. Um, Tim came to Australia less than a decade ago-ish, um, from uh, not not straight from the from the hills and valleys of Wales, but via East London, where he was a major player in the urban regeneration of a, of a region we know very similar to ours, um, the the area east of the uh, Tower Bridge, north and south of the Thames, uh, to to head up the committee for Sydney. Good old married an Aussie girl, moved, moved down here and became uh, one of the institutions of the city, civic institutions. So, Tim, welcome. Thank you for that uh, a rather inflated introduction, if I might say so. I hope that's not going to be the tone of the rest of it. I inflate with the best of them, don't you worry. I forgot to mention also um, I now in a prof adjunct professorial role at Western Sydney University, so passing on the legacy to poor, unsuspecting students in Western Sydney. That is my greatest achievement. My greatest achievement in Australia is to be given the honorary doctorate by Western Sydney University. That is by far the greatest uh, achievement in, in my life in, in Australia. And I'm very, I'm very honored by it. And it was, um, and because I really value the institution of Western Sydney University and the role it's playing, it's not your average university. Except you're a Dr. Williams honorary doctorate. I'm a, I'm a doctor and only with the honorary doctorate. You've got a real doctorate to go alongside it. So, yeah. um, but we're all very grateful to our university. So you, we sit here now amidst a COVID pandemic following drought and bushfires and leading into a global recession. Happy times are here again. <laughs> um, you've been with us on the Western Sydney journey for the past um, almost decade now. Yeah. Remarkable change and lot, lots more to come. Um, prima facie, COVID in a midterm report, does it become, despite its tragedy, uh, a greater generator of form of change and outcome? Or is it a hurdle we just have to endure, then, then effectively start again? Oh, it's definitely the former. I mean, whatever comes out of this, you know, the out of evil cometh good. And I think two, two forms of good. Uh, one is questioning glib assumptions. Uh, and the other one is uh, galvanizing inno innovation. I suppose there's a third, actually, which is to work out what we do value in, in the existing setup. I'm, I'm against uh, the glib assumption that there is something called the new normal and that the new normal is intrinsically better than the old normal. I, I don't know that, but I, I do think that it's, uh, anybody who thinks this is not a fundamental near extinction event uh, is, is talking through their capacious backside. Um, so I think this is a big, big moment. I'm a bit worried that people are, are um, stuck like rabbits in the headlight to, of, of some of this stuff and are, you know, um, and you see some sort of massive decisions being made on the back of an envelope in terms of evidence, but, it's inevitable. Um, and I think it's for voices like people like me and, and others to actually say, okay, uh, what, what, are, what are the facts as we know them? What, what do you, how do you want to use this crisis? You know, because I think it's also about fundamental values as well as kind of contingent facts. You know, it's kind of, where do you want to, where do you yep. want to go? And can this moment in a sense help you take this in the direction that you want to take something? So, I mean, for me, for example, the I think it might, this is my, a bit of a jump, but it's an interesting one. You know, you know, Chris, that for a long time I've been exercised by what I regard as pr pretty poor practice on infrastructure appraisal, where, you know, um, I don't think we've ever in government had the right approach to why we want certain projects. But I think that this moment forces treasuries to change their conventional notion of what a good return is from government investment. Because now I think we'll be asking, will this specific yep. government investment help public health? In Western Sydney, for example, right? That, so that is, for, yeah. So for me, you're, you're, for me, you're, there are good moments. Your not capacious backside is currently sitting. I think I can tell on a bench in your kitchen. Yes. Uh, but as the head of cities Australasia for Arab, you're not in your city office. Is COVID both negative and positive? The 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 digital transformation. Is it the death of cities, just as Western Sydney's trying to build its cities? No, I think Should we, we well, stay I, suburban like we were, or, we, or do we revert to type and this city gave us all it's dressed up to be if no one wants to go in them anymore? I've, I've written a rather energetic piece in the Fifth Estate 
uh, which is out at the moment, which is basically fight for the city. Um, there is a kind of uh, fundamental questioning of the urban going on. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's sort of slightly inflated in the sense that um, some of the most dense cities in the world have managed to emerge without any COVID consequences as far as you can see at all. You know, the, uh, and it, it actually is more down to, I think, city management uh, rather than city density. But, but, but I think what's out of the bottle is the, is the whole idea that we can do much of our work at home and there will be long-term consequences. I think people are being rather naive about whether you can just, I think people assume that the world carries on. It's just that I do my work at home. Well, here's two things for you. I think that that, that disempowering of the CBDs will make Australia poorer, number one. And number two, I think that actually over time it will make individual workers disempowered. Um, because the collectivity of being in the office is an empowering thing. I think we'll see that people who think that they, they can do their job in Balgaula will find that it can also be done in Bangalore. Um, but it so, could also be done in, in Blacktown for us as well. Is there yeah, but, an opportunity for Western Sydney to yeah. take that midpoint where yeah, the campus-style yeah. yeah. suburban centre might, everything might, city might not have to be just George Street CBD? Could yeah. it be... These are, these are related but separate discussions, right? Which is to say that there's a danger of the city being disempowered by this, where, wherever you mean the city. And I think the interim, the, the interim might be, okay, so let us assume, I don't know, 20%, let, I'm being optimistic. Let us assume 20% of workers currently in a CBD will be working at home going forward. Let us just assume that's quite a high number. Um, I actually think it could be 85% because that's what some of the Asian countries are already achieving. But let's just say, a proportion of people, right? That doesn't. That could be a new, a new opportunity for, um, you know, Bendigo out of Melbourne. I think that's probably true. And I'm for a reassertion. I, I want to see stronger regional policy in Australia. I think we've been very weak on regional policy in, in Australia. But I do actually think it's an opportunity to, if you like, reset some of the relationship between the CBD and its sort of suburbs, rather than abolish the CBD. I think it's a slight reinvention of this thing, which actually plays to having a, a slightly more formal polycentric structure to our city, where you would spend a couple of days beyond, you know, at home, but, and maybe going to the CBD. I think the other interim thing people forget is that being at home, nobody really wants to be at home anymore. I think we're all over this thing now. I think what we want, though, is the idea that I might be able to walk up the, to my local uh, little co-working space up the, up the road. So I think we might see that kind of structure. No, nobody's missing the commute, essentially. Well, yeah, but, they, but also people, I think people, are, if you look at the studies done at the beginning of lockdown and now, there's a shift back to people saying, I'm desperate to get out and meet people. I'm desperate to see people at work. I think there's been a shift back yeah. a bit. But look, if you're asking me, have things definitively changed? Yes. Uh, uh, do we know exactly what that change means? No. Is there still a fight on our hands for certain things that we value? Yes. Um, do, and am I an inevitable, inevitableist about this thing? No, I'm not. But I do think this. I think something about strengthening um, the kind of suburban offer is important. Keeping fast connectivity back to the CBD remains important. But that we're, gonna, we, we're seeing a kind of renegotiation of that going on. I don't think that's just a Western Sydney discussion. I think that's a, a kind of international discussion. Tim, you famously last year were the winner of our Dialogue Prize for Collaboration, along with Monica Baroni from the City of Sydney and Lizanne McGregor from the MCA because of your work in your early days the, at uh, Committee for Sydney to be an outreach from the Blue Bloods of the city reached out to, yep. to collaborate with us in Western Sydney. Along the way, you can, you can claim a fair degree of success and influence on some of the big issues we've, we've had since. I, Little Birdie tells me that... Um, one of the areas you think uh, was, a, was a failing on your part to influence others was enough local government reform. Um, mm -hmm. From your experience of running a collective of local government, local boroughs in East London to bring an unlikely group of sometimes rivals and enemies together to the common good, to remind them all that the common enemy was Whitehall and, and, and yeah. City Hall and we should all get together. How do you think we're going in Western Sydney now in a collaborative sense yeah, local yeah. Government. It's, it's a very good point, I think. I think I'm very optimistic about some of the things that's going on in Western Sydney because I think the city deal approach has been very helpful in creating some sort of horizontal collaborations between councils. I mean, I... Um, I you know, in, the we, in the Western city where it's Greenfields, do you think we can replicate that in the central city? In yeah, the, well, I was, the Brownfields let, area? Let me, let me celebrate first, Chris. Let me... Uh, <laughs> so, you know, so, so I, I'm a believer in, in 
stronger local government rather than weaker lo local government. Sometimes that means bigger local government, but at the end of the day, the balance between, I don't think local government's empowered enough or has enough responsibility and therefore needs more, but there's, a, you know, the responsibilities that accrue from that. But I, I really strongly believe that an over-centralized state government system with too many siloed departments is not really good for place management in a, in a city. So I'm really for giving as much power as possible to empowered local government. So I think I love the horizontal relationships that have been developing, which have been city shaping and policy developing. You know, they're really quite original stuff coming out of the city deal in Western Sydney. I think that kind of stuff needs to be replicated. Um, and I think local government needs to sometimes assert itself strongly against the state government, actually. And uh, it'll be good for state government when, when that happens. Um, I'm very optimistic about things like, I think, um, you know, we've seen some good things come out of the Greater Sydney Commission, which, are, which have got a pretty good relationship with local government. But I'd like to see the place infrastructure compact stuff that's been involved by the GSC involve local government a lot more. I mean, it really is a bit strange not to involve Parramatta Council, for example, in in discussing the future of Sydney Olympic Park and its area. I mean, I, whatever you say about governance, at the end of the day, you know, we need local government at the table. You saw firsthand the role, both, both economic and social, the transport links from old West London into New East yeah, London yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah, um, we, we're in the middle we, of a building boom, um, metro lines, some light rail, maybe faster rail that intercity yeah, to yeah. London, so all, all, of, all of which. Are you confident that we get the same transformative effect from the metros that we'll have or that a faster rail from Canberra through to Parramatta might achieve? I think what, what was interesting in the London experience, apart from the fact that the local government really did create and manage upwards, create a lot of these projects. So Channel Tunnel Railing goes through Stratford East London because local government won that campaign the, the treasury didn't want to go there uh, we've got cross rail going north and south of the Thames because local government won the battle to do that so I think it's very important I, I think what we learned from the London experience and Chris you know you you led a trip to East London with a bunch of local authorities from West uh, Western Sydney last year is the way in which we we leveraged uh, each of these transport projects for a multiplicity of benefits so we didn't just do a railway line, we made sure that there was transit oriented development along, you know, we, we made sure there were jobs for local people, some disadvantaged communities. We leveraged the hell out of these projects. And for me, part of the challenge in Sydney where you've got siloed government departments doing separate things is how do we make them come together to maximize- Isn't everybody place making these days? I mean, if you're not place making, uh, yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, trendiest okay. job in Australia. Yeah, yeah, um, we, pre-COVID it was the trendiest, <laughs> job now it's COVID COVID, covid's making places and a whole remaking a whole different model now there are people with jobs with covid in it right you know sort of serious it's become the thing of the moment to be a covid expert of which i claim no such expertise uh, i i think this the um i think place making i think new South Wales government by the way to their credit right have put this far more at the center of the activity of their individual departments and probably any other government mm -hmm. in australia right but I think this, I think you can't really bring all this stuff together in a place without local government being at that table, you see. To, so, to, we, so to be fair to our local governments, it's, it's very much we both saw the power of the strong man, strong person mayor yeah, in East true. London. They essentially yeah. have more power and more resources because the lack of state government um, in, uh, in London. Um, is that, are we being too harsh on them or within their current constraints of resourcing and constitutional power, should they still be asserting themselves even stronger in the mix? Yeah, look, I, t I think two things. I, th I don't blame anybody in this. I just think that they've got used to a kind of um, slightly master-slave dialectic, as, as Hazel, the philosopher, might, might have said. You know, i.e., I think we, we need to get up off our knees a bit sometimes and just uh, give it a go, right? Uh, but also, state government need to recognise the gain that they can get by trusting local government more and having them more at these tables where they decide what the infrastructure is going to be. I think the prize is win-win, to be honest. Um, and I also don't think that you can expect local government to mature even further unless you trust them uh, further. And you can see the difference with the city of Sydney. I mean, it's interesting though, there's a much better relationship between the city yeah. of Sydney and the state government than there's been certainly in my time in Sydney. And you'll tell me it's one of the few times ever, I think so. But what's interesting about that is that the city of Sydney takes some responsibility. It's got skin in the game and shape some of the results and the result is better you know i think Sydney, i look at the good models better. when when Parramatta council their early days put up the light rail concept exactly. uh, liverpool council is now leading the uh, exactly. charge on trackless trams campbelltown lindy's standing up for self about being let exactly. let down ever since whitlam yeah. um 
but I, I, my view is that either state government trusts them more and gives them more or gets rid of them. Because so, yeah, to be stuck okay, in the yeah, middle, yeah, yeah, as we yeah. say locally, to stuck between a shit and a shiver is not a good place to be. And uh, there, there really needs to be some other mechanism we can achieve this by. Do, do you want to, could you translate that, those technical terms that you just uh, use? I was it wasn't it on, what was it on, on your residency application citizenship <laughs> claims? Well, there, there were certain phrases that I... That it sounds I, better I, in Welsh. ...had to learn. Uh, but the, the Welsh, by the way, Welsh language doesn't have any swear words in it uh, because it's a deeply religious culture um so the 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 only the, the druid to, the druidism still flows through you i am proud to report to you that there is one word uh, from welsh in the english language uh which comes from the welsh to uh, to have sex which is uh knachi, which turns up but uh, as nuki uh, so we're responsible for the english nuki which i think is spiritually a good place to be you're in the long list of Welsh lovers. Well, it starts and ends with Tom Jones, if I remember rightly. If I from, asked my my home, mother. from my hometown. In, from uh, hometown. Yeah, I'm not going to ask you to sing. You can play a guitar, but I'm going to ask you to sing. One more question of Western Sydney, and I've had a, yeah. a bit more personal insights of yours. Um, you're a great believer in the walkable city, yeah. quite, quite rightly. Is that just an inner city concept? Uh, in places like Penrith, you have to drive to your car. I mean, there's the yeah. sheer amount of space. Or is it something we need to think about in the development of the cities in Western Sydney rather than the suburb? I mean, it, is it only ever going to be an inner city um, no. attainment or can a suburban base achieve sustainable, walkable centres? So, like, I think we're on the edge of the reinvention of sub suburbs as, as very good mixed-use places to be. I think that the part of the COVID thing that I do believe in is that the cities need to be reinvented at their core but also I think we need to strengthen the offer of the suburbs. And I, I've, as you know, Chris, I've helped write a document for Arup, my company, and it's called Superbia, uh, which is essentially about retrofitting the suburbs to make them more walkable, mixed use, have more jobs, have more uh, the town centres to be more mixed use. Your the question, suburb think, has become a pejorative term in urbanism, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And in fact, I, I challenge people on my LinkedIn site to, to come up with a song that celebrates the suburbs and internationally, we're struggling at this point in time. However, I think this, uh, I think that if you look at the diabetes and obesity map of, of Sydney, it tracks Western Sydney, unfortunately, quite closely. The latte like, line you, is very you much. Can't, a... You can't, you can't ignore it. That the, the uh, public, and if, pub, if public health is now going to shape cities going forward, that's the walkable city, right? So that the walkable city of low emissions is the, is the COVID enabled pandemic resilient city right so i think there will be more not less emphasis on the walkable suburbs it's a design challenge chris not not something that's not needed it's a it's how we do it not whether we should do it and whenever we create a new new suburb or a new subdivision or precinct or whatever it is they must be walkable therefore designed to be walkable within 10 minutes to some shops services or something otherwise chris what we're doing is reinforcing the inequality of the city through its design. So that's walkable, what safe walkable, environmentally walkable, um, amenity uh, walkable, yeah. amenity interesting, rich. interesting walks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and the, the reason why, Chris, is that we know the health consequences of this are really quite severe. People, if people walk to public transport, which they can do in Eastern Sydney, right, that, that may, gives them 10 minutes each, each day, they get fitter than other people who sit on their, those capacious backsides that I mentioned earlier on. There are parts of Sydney where we have designed walkability out. Or at least in Western Either Sydney, place. be able to drive to the bus stop because it's that, it's, it, it's that last kilometre. It's, it's, it's tougher in the burbs, but at yeah. least commuter facilities to interact yeah. public transport. This, is not, this is not a fancy, greeny, uh, up there on, I, I'm mentioning people's backsides rather a lot in this competition, up their own arses, uh, Eastern well Sydney said. urban design thingy, right? It is actually... Uh, an egalitarian intervention to to bring more and a health, health issue for Western Sydney. For Western Sydney. So you, on the personality scale, you're more my end than others. Uh, look at us. It's like my mother from another brother in a in a Welsh dial somewhere. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but how have we talked all about the way cities have evolved or adapted and and transformed during COVID pandemic etc. Recessions. I'm. I, like, I started as a CEO very early in life, and most of my compatriots in the mid-50s have never run a business out of recession. We've had 30 years economic sunshine. It's a major challenge for Australian corporate culture for the geniuses to know how to run a business in a recession. But we're all being through the, these transformations. 
how are you different? How is, would Michelle at home notice a difference uh, with Eleanor? Would, would your colleagues, are you writing, have, have you transformed through this process? Is it this, uh, last, this last six months? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I have in a way, I think, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I sort of, I have a, an absolutist view and a, and a relatively modest one. I have two at the same time. My, I didn't assume you only have one view on something that would be. <laughs> my, my big view is that it's, uh, I want to do Australia first. I want to do Australia first, right? So 20, 26 years of, of growth, uninterrupted growth. Yep. But that was, that was the national Ponzi scheme that is immigration, right? So, so i.e., we've been deluding ourselves for a long while around um, the GDP per head, uh, the productivity per head rather than overall. Opening a closed growth. economy and population to flow is a combination that's given us... Yeah, yeah. without the population growth, there would have been no, you know, there would have been recessions, right? So, so I think that's put us to sleep two things put us to sleep, the resources, economy, and migration, I think, right? So this is a kind of very interesting and important wake-up call, really. I mean, you know, if, if grasped properly, this would be the best thing that ever happened to Australia, the, the, because we have come out of this in, 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 in terms of deaths really well, right? You know, so I can't remember what the number is now, 600, can't remember, but there are, there are more people have died in one London council in East London than in the whole of Australia, right? So we've got to get over ourselves, Chris. We've got to get over the fear, right? This is a successful result. Uh, I don't feel like giving up the urban for an incredibly successful result on the health front, right? So I think we, we really just got to collect our nerve and not give up stuff. Just realize how successful we've been. That's one, I think. So for me, I've become more determined to point out to people, this is a successful place, right? Okay, because I know what an unsuccessful place looks like. Number two, I think I've discovered just about, shockingly so, that the bureaucracy was okay. You know, the, um, the bureaucracy didn't do that badly. I think pandemic uh, management failed everywhere on the planet in a democracy. It failed everywhere. The, the, the initial response was collapse, right? You know, i.e. governments have not had great advice from the bureaucrats that were responsible for pandemic planning. They haven't. But we've been quite innovative after that moment of, you know, of dropping in, in standards. I mean, Australia has not done badly in terms of the quality of bureau, bureaucratic advice to ministers. It's been, been quite okay. Thirdly, the community, what's come out of this for me massively is the co-production of, of, of life by the community. You know, who is solving this problem? And the answer is us, right? So that the, this high moment of governments working with the people to, to, to deliver a result, we must not come back from this high point, Chris, is my point, right? You know, i.e., whenever we plan, and you know I'm obsessed with this subject, whenever we plan an infrastructure project, never again try and pull the wool over people's eyes about the, the business case for it. You know, you should just openly say, this is the bureaucratic analysis of why we need this big road system. It's going to muck up I, these... I, I don't think John systems. Bradfield had a business case for the, for the pylons on the Harbour Bridge. Yeah, I know, guarantee that Jorn Utzon wasn't putting a business case forward for the just, Opera just, House. But, just, 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 but, but, but I literally mean have the civic dialogue, right, in a very open fashion, because you can trust the people more than you thought, right, to be a bit more mature on these matters. Come back to me. I mean, I feel a bit fundamentalist at the moment. I feel kind of... Um, that I think I've learned that we are... We, there was a kind of fool's paradise pathway in life. I think I've become a bit of a, a religion-free Protestant again. I kind of worry about uh, whether, you know, we were all kind of like kidding ourselves about the quality of what we were, what we were doing. And this has really reminded us yep. of what actually matters hugely in life. And then who matters? Because, you know, I mean, knowledge workers like ourselves sitting on those aforementioned capacious backsides, uh, you know, earning two kinds of money. One, actual money from my employer was sitting on my backside. And two, not necessarily now, but generally earning money by sitting on my backside, watching my house go up in value for doing bugger all, right? Well, then you realize that 30 to 40% of Australians couldn't do what I've just been doing. They've actually been on, on various forms of government subsidy, and they've got a very uncertain future ahead. So I'm, I'm hoping we've rediscovered there are poor and yeah. working class people living in Australian cities, not just rich middle class people. So I hope we never forget ever again. That, and the other thing is, I don't know if you ever heard me say this, the one thing I dis I'm disappointed with when I came to Australia, and you know I'm very exercised about this, is who, who the hell are people calling other people houses? Who are they? I mean, you know, are they Australians by any chance? You know, I, I came here assuming that this was a blue collar paradise in which working class people that I grew up with were all 
respected and that there was no class distinction or snobbery in Australian life. It we have applied the egalitarian. We, 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 two things. We, we tell the world we're the great, we're the never, never, you know, outback when we're the greatest suburban dwellers on the face of the earth. Yeah. Secondly, yeah, we make fun of, we're, 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 we're this great egalitarian society where we've got the highest level of private education in the world. Well, I was going to say, thirdly, think, we call yeah, everybody else recent arrivals boat people when my rallies came as involuntary tourists at the bottom of galleons 220 years ago. We're yeah. all boat people. If you're not indigenous, you're all came here. But uh, yeah, there is, uh, we can sometimes fool ourselves, but we don't always fool people from the outside. So I, I'm, I think that one of the things that might have happened is, that, is the discovery that there are these other people. Uh, you know, and by the way, if you look at the people who've been doing it hard, many of them in Western Sydney, I, I tell you, right? They are people who are on, you know, jobs they couldn't do it at, uh, at home and they've kind of, where are they now? They, they, are, they are also um, people who um, might be renting, for example, and we know that renters and people in these jobs have been doing it particularly difficult. They may be young people. Uh, so I, I think we've got a real rediscovery that there's a bunch of people out there uh, I was going to call them citizens, but I don't mean citizens. What, in white white middle-class men have increased the disparity with everybody else during COVID. It's one of the, the, yeah, the divides. And I, and I, I have to tell you, you you'll be shocked. You know, one of the things that I'm a profound democratic egalitarian. I mean, I really am. So I, I can't stand all these tech billionaires who are min making a mint. They're making so much money at the moment. The uh, billions and billions when other people are losing their. So we've really got profound things. But and, and I, I, you know, you've got me on a roller. The the thing I really love. You're always on a roll. What, what Australia is doing now with uh, taking on Google is really important and nobody else is doing it, right? So we're taking so on I, China I, at the same time, which is well, brave. Taking on Google, but, the two of the three most powerful things that we're taking on at the same time. Yeah, it's funny. It reminds me of when I once had, a, I once had the great pleasure of organising a march to, in support of solidarity in, uh, in, in, in Wales in 1981 against martial law. And I, 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 I invited these fantastic Polish people to speak and one guy gets up and he says uh, he's I, I, I told him not to say this but he says um, <clears throat> I have an old Polish joke he said uh, if the Germans and the uh, Russians invaded at the same time who would we fight first and he said um, it would be the Germans because it would be business before pleasure <laughs> right and I feel I feel that you know fighting Google and <laughs> China at the same time is a kind of business before quick, pleasure. What, a, a spectacular dismount um, I've asked everybody I've interviewed when they're in lockdown, what were they watching? What Netflix program? I'll probably ask you, what have you been reading? I know not really oh, the Netflix kind of guy. Give, oh, give us one book that normal humans can maybe go and have a read and think about. Oh, this is the one. This is the one. Crit cynical critical theories. If you want to understand what all this woke extremism afflicting our universities, all this stuff around uh, the gender race obsessions of the moment, where they've all come from, this book is a very insightful, hilarious uh, will tell you everything you need to know. So I'm afraid it's quite a serious uh, book. The only thing I would say to you, there's a really good um, uh, thing on ABC called The Accident, which is about a Welsh, uh, an accident in a Welsh Valley community, a bit like Aberfan, I think is what it's based on, you know, when 120 children died in a, in a pitfall. And it's got accents that I haven't heard for decades. And they're, they're people like me, uh, which is to say, Clever, bankrupt. Uh, hey, most kids. Western Sydney kids will simply remember it growing up watching the Goodies episode where the train train ran and the station name went for three minutes. So uh, we went, when it went through wild. One last thing before we go. One last yep. thing before we go. Right. So the when I first came, this is a good thing that you, that you and I we discovered each other, Chris, and I discovered Western Sydney partly through you, right? So the- I discovered East London through you, so it's- yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you invited me when I was in early days, to early 2012, to give a talk uh, at the Opera House because you brought- uh, Paramatta came to town. To town, right? And I, I remember getting up and saying that uh, what we had discovered in London was that we, in order to, to, for London to have a great future, East London, East London needed a day, its day in the sun, right? And I, I essentially sort of began to transplant this kind of sub-regional thinking to Sydney and uh, you, you were one of the people who helped translate that kind of uh, stuff and I don't think we've ever looked back and I think the second thing is some of the best experiences I've had I'll leave you with this one I love this one so I went to see Western Sydney um, uh, play um, Wanderers or the Giants the Wanderers. I went to see the Wanderers play uh, I got criticized actually by uh, Joseph Carotti of PwC for saying for tweeting something but uh, he's biased uh, it was um, I, I, I heard people do this chant I'd never heard before, you know, 
who do we sing for? We sing for Western Sydney. And I just thought that, that's absolutely. And I put Committee for Sydney says, who do we sing for? We sing for Western Sydney. And I was pointed out to me that this was a sectarian intervention and there were other parts, <laughs> other parts of Sydney we should sing for as well. Like, you know. But I do think that the difference is there is an identity. There are people I identify with. You know, I, you didn't ask me, you know, right? I, I, you know, I come from a mining town in South Wales. My parents were both factory workers. I grew up in public housing. Where else do you think I would identify myself with other than the good people of Western Sydney? And I think the difference, and you know this, is that the, the Western Sydney is a place with a big future. I come from a place that had a big future 120 years ago. It's Still waiting to discover it, but hopefully we'll get that. We're getting there first. Tim Williams, Dr. Williams, um, uh, uh, recent arrival, massive contribution. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.